Okay, welcome everybody. There's a few uh, participants who are still connecting to audio, so we'll just give it a, a minute and let everyone connect to audio. We appreciate all of you um, being so timely. It's great. Um, also looks like we've got a few other folks joining us, so appreciate your patience and we will get started here shortly. <laughs> as soon as we get this. Yeah, give it just a second. Okay, it looks like we are all connected. Um, again, well, and of course, we're going to get a few other people as, as the evening progresses, but we'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Gladys Cornell, and I'm with AIM Consulting. I'm the uh, facilitator for this workshop. You're here uh, tonight to uh, work with us on the uh, bus routing optimization study, which uh, we will go into a little bit more um, a little bit later. But thank you for joining us this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, before we get started, I just want to recognize that uh, everybody has come in muted uh, into this into this into this virtual workshop. It's mainly so that uh, background noise and everything doesn't disrupt the the uh, presentations for everybody. So we're going to keep you on mute. Um, but we do uh, want very much to um, hear your comments and your questions. So I, I want to just sort of uh, give you a little orientation. I know probably many of you have uh, done at least at least one Zoom meeting, so you probably have a lot of familiarity with it. But just in case, um, as I mentioned, you're going to remain muted during the presentation, and that's just to limit any background noise. But we really do want to hear from you. And so if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to share them in the chat box. We will be monitoring those, uh, we'll be monitoring those, those comments and questions. And when we have, we'll have a little periodic uh, breaks where we will uh, look to answer, uh, answer any of the questions you may have. And, and then just also we'll be documenting your, your comments as well. I also should probably mention that we are recording this meeting and that a summary of the recording will be posted on the website. So, if somebody you know uh, wasn't able to make the meeting, um, please feel free to share the uh, the link to the website, and we'll share that with you uh, in the chat box. Um, please share that with them, and they'll be able to uh, to hear uh, the presentation uh, as well as we'll have a summary of the of the workshop as well. Okay, so. This evening we're going to I'll, I'll do a quick introduction of the project team. We are going to be doing uh, some live polling and we're going to be using the Mentimeter and we'll kind of go through how to how to use that and how to interact with us on that. Um, we will also share with you an introduction about the project. Um, the project team has done a lot of uh, upfront work uh, looking at sort of the existing conditions and evaluating the service, the bus service. We'll share the um, information from that and then We'll also go over the survey outreach and results. And then we're gonna go over potential improvement options. And then we'll do a quick uh, question and answer and then share with you how to stay involved. So the project team, I'll go through the names quickly. If you wouldn't mind just raising your hand when I say your name, that would be great. For BCAG, we have Sarah Kane, John Clark, Victoria Proctor and Amy White. For LSC, the planning firm, Gordon Shaw and Celia McKinney. AECON, we have Andrew Edison. Oh, and then, <laughs> sorry, Andrew, you want to <laughs> share your last oh, name? <laughs> that's good. Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then with helping me uh, with AIM is Katie DeMeo and Angelica Williams. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little practice session with the polling. So if you could go to, you can either on your computer, you can go to the Menti website, which is www.menti, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com, and then put in the code 9786-5963. Or if you like, and you have your uh, phone with you, your smartphone, you can use QR code, which will also give you access to the Mentimeter 
and that's on the screen. Okay, so <laughs> uh, Angelica has brought up the, the question. And so the first question is, do you currently use the Beeline service? And Angelica or Katie, if you could just let me know when you think we've had. Hi, could you repeat the number or type it in the chat box? Sure, it's right at the top. So it's, and we can, uh, we can put it in the chat box too, uh, Katie, if you wouldn't mind. So the website is www.menti, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com. And then you just enter the code. You'll see the, the little, the little Mentimeter. It says, please enter code. Then all you need to do is type 97865963. Or as I mentioned, if you want to use your uh, phone, your smartphone, you can just put your camera on the little QR code and it'll bring up your bring up that website. So we'll just give it a sec and just leave it on this for just a second so that we can see, give people just a little more opportunity. This is why we do the easy questions first. <laughs> So everybody gets comfortable with the with the Mentimeter. And we do have a gentleman who's waiting. I'm going to just let him in. I don't, Katie, I don't know if that was. Okay, maybe uh, we can try this again. So the first question in the, uh, oh, good. Okay, so it looks like we've got a few more folks. And the first question is, do you currently use the Beeline service? And then if also, if you want to add any comments to your, to your answers, please feel free to uh, add that in the chat box. And um, again, the chat box is just down below uh, at the bottom of your screen. It says chat. If you click that, it'll open up and you can, um, you can uh, type your comments. Please do make sure that you're sending it to everybody, your comments, um, because we can't capture it otherwise. Okay, so the next question is where in Butte County do you spend most of your time? And um, we have a list of places, Biggs, Chico, Ridley, Oroville, Paradise, or other. And if it is other, if you wanted to share where that is, um, you can type that in the Zoom box. So we have a significant representation of Chico. We got one from Oroville and Gridley. That's great. So Mentimeter is doing things a little differently now. They're doing these little dots. I haven't seen this before. It's kind of, kind of interesting. <laughs> Okay. Well, great. This is very helpful for us just to understand, you know, one, how our outreach is doing in some of the other areas. And I think we have opportunities to improve that, but good to see that we've got some really strong representation in other, in some of the other locations. So uh, thank you for, for doing that. All right. So with that, we'll move on to the presentation. And uh, Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Butte County Association of Governments? Sure, thank you, Gladys. And hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Keen. I'm a senior planner here at BCAG. And just wanna thank you for spending your evening with us. We know that there are a lot of Zoom calls these days and we really appreciate your time. So we just wanted to introduce our agency and provide a little bit of introduction to this study. Um, as some of you may know, BCAG is known as the Butte County Association of Governments. We are what's called a regional transportation planning agency. We're also a metropolitan planning organization and we are the owners and operators of Beeline. And so as the MPA, and RTPA were responsible for preparing various state and federally required plans and programs. 
These are mostly necessary for securing different transportation funding for highways, streets and roads, transit, which we're talking about today, um, and other bicycle and pedestrian facilities and other modes as needed. And so as the owner and operator of Beeline, we are preparing a routing study. And that's basically to take an in-depth look at our system as it is today and try to identify with your all's input um, preferred service options and develop a plan for implementation. So we'll be looking at the Beeline routes and schedules. We'll also review our fare policies and fare media. We'll be taking another look at the technologies that we have, vehicle needs, facilities, and other assets. And with your help, um, we will be identifying our strengths and weaknesses just to identify appropriate alternatives and evaluate service options to improve the functionality of transit in Butte County. So we're excited to have you all here today. And I'm going to pass it over to Gordon Shaw with LSC to review the study goals. Gordon, you're on mute. Good afternoon all, I'm Gordon Shaw with LSC uh, Transportation Consultants and we are um, leading up the, the study team um, with uh, AECOM um, focusing on some of the uh, more technical elements of it. Um, but uh, I'll be doing um, a good part of the presentation here for the next few minutes um, going over uh, where we are really right now and some of the things we're starting to look at. Um, but to start at a higher level here, the overall study goals that um, we are trying to, to uh, achieve here, uh, providing recommendations to effectively expand mobility um, and looking at it more from an overall mobility point of view, not just can the bus get down the road, but how is it serving people and making uh, uh, people's lives better in terms of getting to where they need to go. Uh, we, are, we are working towards identifying and thoroughly evaluating alternative routing options, and um, that is where the bus goes, that is uh, where the, uh, what times the bus go, and the schedule. We'll be looking at things like the, what we call the span of service, whether we should have later service or earlier service. Uh, one thing that we hear a lot is uh, more service on weekends, particularly Saturday. Um, and also uh, kind of beyond routing um, is uh, the idea of other service types. Um, we'll be talking uh, in a little bit about uh, something called microtransit, um, and I'll get into a lot more detail there, but that's a more flexible form of service that may be appropriate in some of the more outlying areas in rural areas uh, to provide better mobility that way. Um, and finally, developing in innovative solutions that make the best use of Beeline's existing resources. Uh, being realistic um, these days, uh, we are uh, up against limits on money, uh, the dollars that are available for, for public transit. Uh, we're up against some operational limits of getting enough drivers to operate the service. Uh, and uh, we are focusing really more on what can we do with the existing resources rather than, at least in the short term, rather than something of, you know, what could we do if we could double the amount of service or something like that. So we are, we're really focusing more on, let's look for ways to improve efi existing efficiency and in the big picture of things, uh, make sure that we're developing a transit plan for the future that really meets the current needs. And I'll get into some details, but, but the needs have changed over the last even you know, more like 10 years, you know, much more than the last two years. Um, and so the question of what's the right service plan for where Butte County and the various communities um, uh, are now and what can we expect to see at least over the, particularly like the next five to 10 years. Um, so I'm going to go off into the existing conditions review and the service evaluation. Um, there is quite the document that's on the BCAG website uh, where we go into very much detail about reviewing the existing services. And boy, if you wanna see all the nuts and bolts on, on transit service, 
Um, there's, there's a lot of nuts and bolts in there to look at. But we start off by looking at the community and what the needs are. Um, and in particular, we're looking for various elements of the community that tend to use transit more or have a more need for transit. So those in particular that we see in Butte County, um, where we have a higher proportion in, in our service area here than and is seen around the other parts of the state or the country, um, we have a, a higher proportion of low income residents. Um, we have a higher proportion of senior residents and we have a higher proportion of residents with a disability. And those are all things that uh, factors that tend to increase the need for, for public transit service. Uh, we've got a very good appreciation that transit service is important uh, for Chico State and for Butte College and really for the operation of those, um, those college and university um, given the constraints of parking and access and so on. So that's, a, that's kind of a, a key asset in the community. Um, one of the key considerations, and I think we can, we can all think our way through uh, that chart, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, but um, the total ridership on B-Line, um, you can see is, is a, kind of a sobering little shot of reality there. Really met it, you got to a peak um, in 2013 and a little bit of a decline after that, but but then it's pretty significant decline even before COVID. So if you think of 2019 as the last full year before pandemic hit, we were down to about 750,000 riders from a high of almost 1.4 million. Um, that is not an unusual curve, unfortunately, for public transit um, in, the, in the teens of this century. Um, a lot of that gets driven by the, the, oh, the effective cost of driving really dropped. Um, there, was a, there, was, there was a time, believe it or not, when used cars were relatively cheap and easy to get and, and gas was relatively inexpensive. And we saw a lot of shift in, across the country. Um, as, as less people use public transit. So we have that factor and then we, then we have the impact of COVID. And you can see in 2020 is really our low year there, uh, uh, about 350,000. So that is a big change from our peak. Um, the glass half full part is that since then, ridership has increased by about 35% um, from that low and it's still going up. Uh, kind of month to month, we can see it's it's up, up over the year previously. Uh, but I think it's realistic to say that that we are will not see 1.3 million riders on on B line, you know, in the foreseeable future. Uh, there's just been changes in society, particularly in terms of working from home. Uh, the other thing that obviously the people who you know lived through it know that in the midst you know 2018-19 we were getting impacted by fires and uh, up on the ridge and in paradise and Megalia, all the changes that went that went on there and that's that's impacted things too. However, public transit still has important functions. There still is a need to be uh, providing an option for people who need public transit uh, to get around. Um, and day-to-day -day functions as um, for things like social service trips and for going, getting to work. Um, and then in an era of $5 plus gas prices, um, there may well be some more rebound um, and a need for service. Um, so getting into some of the details here of um, how the individual routes work and the, the system works, um, we've done quite the review of the, the effectiveness of the transit services, and um, there are areas of Chico that generate uh, relatively low ridership. Um, I, would, I mentioned in particular in the Route 7 area out, on, um, out towards Manzanita Street and so on on the east side of town. Uh, some of the parts of, of kind of far northwest um, that you can see Route 16, the far end there of Route 16 is relatively low ridership for the amount of service that we provide. Um, there is uh, corridors of very high ridership, relatively high ridership, and actually I will say 
good ridership for a, a community of the size of Chico, uh, particularly between the downtown Chico State area and out to the southeast, uh, the, the mall and the Butte College uh, Chico campus. There's, a, there's good ridership also on, on straight north from downtown, like along Route 2, you can see up towards North Valley Plaza. So we've got some a core area there that is good. Um, we've noticed that there are some neighborhoods that really are too far away from a bus stop to say that they're served. And we typically consider that to be like a five minute walk, about a quarter mile walk is, is as far as we want people to walk. But you can see to the on the west side, sort of north of Route 3 there, there's a neighborhood. There's kind of a hole in the middle between uh, Route 3 and route, and route 16. So there's some there's some opportunities there to consider how the routes could be realigned to serve those areas. And then the other thing I'll say is that we, we found a pattern in North Chico, um, kind of around the North Valley Plaza area, um, of people that are using the transit system that don't want to go downtown. And most of our routes are basically focused on get you to downtown and then get back out again. But we'll be looking at options to shift that away towards more of a, perhaps more of a hub on the at North Valley Mall area. Let's go on, please. <clears throat> um, so on to other areas of um, the B-line service. Um, Oroville area, we've, um, that looks very complicated there. That, map on the right, uh, the route, the red route you see coming up to the north, that's Route 20 that does the intercity service and Route 30 is heading off to go to, to Gridley and Bakes. Um, but uh, the other four routes there, that is a complicated way of showing two buses that are serving Oroville, you know, on one loop and then a loop on the other route and they, they bounce back and forth. Um, what we have found there is that there is a core area um, that's more east of 99 um, and uh, kind of south of the river that is a pretty good ridership. But there are also areas that we're trying to serve that get very low ridership um, and there may be options on how to serve that better. Um, On-time dependability is a problem and that kind of gets to the question of maybe we're trying to serve too much of an area and um, because it, you know, if you can't depend on the bus being there within, you know, at least, you know, three to five minutes of when it, it, the schedule says, it's very difficult to use it, particularly for things like getting to work where you have to be on time. Um, so that again is an argument, is an indication of the need to look at the service area. Um, we also identified that smaller vehicles could serve current uh, passenger loads. Um, as well as some growth in passenger loads. So one of the things we're looking at on the capital side is perhaps that those should be more of 20 to 25 passenger vehicle, uh, vehicles rather than larger buses. Um, and then something that we, I don't have a, a separate slide on it, but we do have routes that are connecting the, the key areas. We, the route between uh, Paradise and Oroville is not running. Um, but uh, the, all the other routes are in, particularly Route 20 between Oroville and Paradise, I'm sorry, between Oroville and Chico, as well as, as 1441 um, that go from, uh, that go up the ridge. There, there's really strong ridership on that. And as well as Route Shirt 30 um, has got um, a good base of ridership. So we appreciate that those are routes that, that need to be operated. Let's go on. Um, I'm going to talk for a moment about the survey, and uh, we did do um, onboard surveys in December um, and got about 280 people, uh, specifically 280 people to participate in that in those surveys. We did flyers and, and um, awareness materials and the signs saying, please take our survey in English and Spanish and Hmong. Um, and you could see the QR codes and everything that we did on the right side there of, um, of uh, to get outreach on that. So we felt that that was a good uh, overall sample of people using the transit service. We go on to the next one. Um, there is quite a lot more detail that's in the existing conditions memo, but um, to summarize, about a third of the, of the riders were students. Um, and that includes university students, college students, as well as a good number of high school students. 
Um, we see the, the high schools, particularly in Chico as, and as well as Oroville as being good transit um, uh, generators. Um, about a third of respondents are employees that are going to work. Um, we looked at what routes people are transferring between and it's route in three and four and then 14 and 15. That helps us to design the schedule so that it's more convenient for most people. Um, a lot of transfers uh, to and from 14, which serves uh, the mall area in Southeast. And so what we see is a pattern of people coming from all over Chico, they get to the transit center and then they go out to uh, the mall area and the big box stores there. Uh, we asked opinions on uh, what people thought about the overall service and we got a very nice, uh, good report there that 87% of respondents indicated they believe B-Line is either excellent, five out of a one out of five, or good, four out of one, uh, one out of five. So the people that use the service um, in general think it's, it, it's very useful um, and, and have a high regard for it. And um, one of the uh, pat on the back to the, uh, the service contractor that the highest uh, ranking factor was, was driver courtesy. Um, they like their drivers. Um, and they believe that the fare levels are, are good. The affordability of the service is good. Uh, the lowest ranking factors were bus stops and shelters. There was a very, pretty strong need, um, a desire for improving shelters at the stops, as well as um, schedule information at the bus stops so that they can understand the system better. And then what they really want, I mentioned before, is um, they want more frequent weekend service in particular. Uh, so we will be looking seriously at that as well as more shelters. So um, that's kind of the look uh, back. And the next slide here um, is a little bit of discussion about um, a look forward of what we're starting to think our way through on with regards to improvements. Um, so uh, the relatively straightforward and traditional things that we'll be doing is looking at those route maps and um, really taking them apart and looking at the fixed routes, whether they're on the right streets, uh, whether we can like do things like serve new areas by revising them, uh, whether we're putting too much service in some areas. Um, there are some streets like Esplanade where we've got long sections with two routes. Maybe it doesn't need two routes, particularly given the reduction in, in demand, and maybe we can move that over and make better use of that resource. So we'll be doing that. Um, I've already mentioned a few times that we'll be looking at the schedules, um, the span of service, as well as the frequency of service. Are there are there particular corridors that perhaps more midterm, long term, we can look at more frequent service because that certainly is a big convenience for riders. Um, so that's uh, that's a big order to look at this big area with all these routes. But we're we're up to the task. The other thing that I wanted to dive into um, in a little bit more detail is this question: this this com this potential for micro transit service. Um, and it's kind of a fancy term, um, it is, but it is something that if you want to think about it as kind of the public transit Uber um, is one way to, to consider it. Um, but it is just like Uber and Lyft or DoorDash or whatever, it is using um, advanced technologies and cell phones to organize uh, demand response trips. So you can see in the upper right-hand corner is an example of what it looks like if you download it to your phone or you can download it to your computer or tablet or whatever device, um, and then use that. You basically can just open that up and tap on it and ask for, and basically say, I need a ride. Um, and it will, the, the software behind it will actually organize the trip and tell a van driver to come pick you up and it will tell you that you're going to get, like in this case, you're gonna get a pickup in three minutes and you can watch the van, the little van drive on the map as it comes around and picks you up at your, at your front door. Um, this is uh, something that uh, is being done in places like Sacramento, the RT system in Sacramento, that lower right-hand map, that is a, 
an example of the zone area for one of the nine zones that they have down there um, for micro transit. Um, and you can see that they still have fixed routes in South Natomas there and North Natomas, um, but they also have an area that you can basically get picked up. You can ask for a ride and it will pick you up. It'll take you to any other place in that area or it'll take you to a key transit hub if you wanna go downtown in this case or someplace else on the fixed route. So it's a feeder uh, service um, into the fixed route. Um, and it is appropriate, for, it, it is uh, for areas with relatively low demand. You can imagine if you have too many people asking for trips, then you're putting so many drivers out there that your costs can go way up. Um, but in some of our areas that we've, we've talked about already, um, I mentioned um, the out toward uh, Manzanita and Bruce uh, on the east side of, of, Ch of Chico, perhaps that's a good zone area for that kind of service. Uh, perhaps that'll allow us to get closer to more people's homes and provide a, a better quality of service given the pattern out there. Um, I also think uh, we will be looking at whether there's parts of the outlying areas of Paradise and Megalia up on the ridge you know, right now the fixed route is trying to cover a lot of area by doing a lot of, uh, to be blunt, wandering around um, to serve a lot of areas. And that may be better off uh, doing something like this micro transit. And then the last one is the outlying areas of Oroville that have low ridership. So um, I will be interested in any comments that people have about whether that sounds like a good idea for, for Chico or Oroville or up on the ridge. Um, I have one last slide here and, or actually uh, two, but one last of our improvements. I mentioned hours and weekend service. Uh, the other thing that we will be looking at um, in terms of operations and so on is uh, prioritization for buses at key traffic signals. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention with regards to the existing service quality is there are a number of routes that don't, are having trouble staying on schedule and the buses are late. Um, and um, one of the ways that we can help to solve that without putting, you know, shortening the routes or putting more buses out is to give uh, buses a, not an automatic green light, but a, a, the opportunity if the bus is heading for the signal, it's about to turn red. There's the technology out there to say, let's give it another 10 or 15 seconds of green time so that bus can get through. Um, and it can be a real substantial improvement in the, the quality of service. The studies all show in places like Davis that have done it, um, the motorist, the average motorist might have a one or 2% increase in delays, but the bus can have like a 15 or 20% reduction in delays. And so that's one more thing we'll be looking at. Um, so that is a kind of an overview at the, the high level of the options that we are, that are working through. Um, and here is our overall schedule that we are, um, we are following here and we are deep into summer of 2022. We've got, we are working on a public meeting here. Um, we are maybe a little bit behind on that, but I think overall schedule we're doing fine. Um, we will be over the rest of the summer and into the fall working on the service alternatives um, and developing our recommendations for, for route optimization. Um, we will have some more opportunities for public input um, um, after we do that. Um, when we get to the alternative stage, we'll be presenting very specific alternatives and asking for input on that. Then we'll be um, in, into the winter and developing that into an actual plan. Um, there's some other pieces that come along with this in terms of the capital plan, the, the fare structure, um, and some marketing um, that goes along with that. And the idea is that we, by early, late winter, early sp uh, spring, we have a, a draft plan that is, a, again, put out for public review and comment. So with that, I've worked my way through all of that and I'll turn it back uh, to Gladys for some more polling. Yep, 
Thank you, Gordon. Before we get into the polling, though, I wanted to, uh, we did get a comment in the chat box. It was, it was a, kind of a question, but also a comment, I think. And uh, it was related to, you know, possibly considering a beeline to Sacramento as a way to increase public transit usage and market for new and existing services. Gordon, do you have any um, comments or uh, regarding that suggestion? Um, I will, I will start off, but I bet Sarah Kane at, at BK can also comment on that. Just, um, I guess earlier this year, uh, BK um, completed a study, a commuter study done to Sacramento. And um, this gets into um, the San Joaquin train system and the, the Amtrak um, connector services that, that tie into the trains. Um, because there are buses today that provide that service, um, and there is an opportunity to shift that service over towards more of a local operated service and expanding it. Um, that in this study indicated um, a, a good ridership potential for service to Sacramento. Um, and um, the I, I will leave it to Sarah to talk about the potential for when that could be implemented. Sure, thanks, Gordon. And thank you for the comment. We are also doing what we're calling the North Valley Passenger Rail Study, which is looking at extending passenger rail from Natomas to Butte County. Um, the Beeline to Sacramento service would be further explored after that study is done because that study is also working with the San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority and the Beeline service to Sacramento would likely be supplemental to any rail service. So it is something that we continue to look at. As Gordon mentioned, it did have a favorable ridership output. Um, with delays with COVID, we're hoping that that study is going to be complete sometime in the next year or so. So we should have more answers on that. But as Gordon mentioned, there is currently a service that does provide access to Sacramento from Butte County. Um, through the San Joaquin's Amtrak service. And I do see um, another question on here about free transportation for low to no income riders. That is something that we get often. Um, I think that it is something that we may explore as part of that study and thank you for your comment. Thanks, Sarah. So um, I, I, we those were the two questions that we received, but I know that Gordon also shared quite a bit of uh, yeah. recommendations and suggestions that they're considering in regards to the improvements. So before we go into the online polling, I just, did anybody have any clarifying questions for Gordon? Um, we're happy to sort of take those now. We have, a, we have a bit of time, so I'm happy to take that. So if you want to ask that in the chat box, or if you wanted to raise your virtual hand and let us know you'd like to ask that question verbally, we're happy to do that as well. Uh, if you've not raised your virtual hand before, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a uh, you'll see a either a reactions button and you can click that and, and click any image and we'll know that that's a raise hand. Um, or you can't, or it might be under the more three dots if you don't have a reactions button and you will see the raised hand icon in there if you click that. But I wanted to just give a moment because I know a couple people um, had uh, joined a little bit late. So wanted to just give that opportunity for any sort of clarifying questions. Did we get a raised hand icon, mm -hmm. Katie? I can't see, oh, there we go. Uh, uh, can you unmute? Mr. Coughlin? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good, um, thank you. Um, just uh, two, two different areas. First is on on uh, going to Sacramento, I would suggest you consider uh, making a connection through the Ubisoda first. That would be a lot easier, a lot cheaper. And, uh, and once you build up, uh, identify enough ridership there, then you can look to go to Sacramento. To connect to Ubisoft first. Uh, main reason I, I on here tonight is I live in Gridley, and I'm concerned that uh, there's a lot of growth between Gridley and and uh, Biggs in an area called the Back Biggs Road, or Gridley Biggs Road, of which you do have service right now. And my concern is is that 
I'm looking at these plans and uh, the uh, various governments are allowing developers to change the elements of the general plan, which are designed to uh, encourage high density housing and its location close to highways for the purposes of better uh, transit and allowing them to really destroy that whole concept um, and basically totally disregard transit. And I would encourage uh, somebody in transit to start looking at these developments and letting these uh, governments know what they're doing. For example, the uh, it's called the Chandler Project. Uh, the, it's a uh, Bernard Project just north of Heron Landon on the Back Biggs Road. They're going in where they should be building 400 houses uh, with high density on the north end of the project. They're only going to build 200 houses. So essentially, they've already made this thing sprawl. And they've eliminated high density housing for their concept of uh, sort of middle in density. And they've moved any dense housing from close to the road to well away from the road. So right there, that kind of throws a wrench back at you for planning transit. And it would be nice if you would go tell them that now while they're looking at it in LAFCO uh, in August 4th. Second thing of it is, is they're allowing this plan to not include uh, properties right next to the highway, but about 200 properties on 40 acres behind it. And that means then they don't want to improve the road and they don't want to then put in bus stops and, and developers are trying to avoid doing all those expenses and current uh, uh, county government will probably allow them to do that. Uh, but this is going to leave you out of, you know, with no plan, no funding source in the, in development to, uh, to put in bus stops. So uh, I guess my concern is, is I would encourage you to be part of the, uh, look over some of these developments and uh, try and make sure that the uh, transit is a part of their thinking. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coughlin. Um, okay. Uh, there were a few more questions that came into the uh, chat box, which I'll go through. Does the, stout, the, does the study include paratransit routes? Yes, the study includes paratransit service and a review of paratransit service. Great, thank you, Gordon. What have been the ridership impacts in the nine zones for Sacramento's microtransit? Uh, it has been uh, realistic, it's been modest um, in most of them. Uh, one of the key factors that, that transit planners look at is how many passengers you serve per hour that the bus is on the road, so passengers per service hour. And those, those micro transit zones have been in the range of three passengers an hour. Um, so it's, it really is for areas that are, are pretty um, low ridership, one or low ridership potential. Um, there are areas that are higher than that. And there are communities that have, have seen higher numbers. Um, one of the other strategies back to paratransit is to provide general public um, microtransit service at the same time that the driver is, use, is providing paratransit service um, for kind of individual trips on both services. Um, and so combining that and making better use of resources that way. But realistically, um, it's relatively low. Um, I'm going to I'm going to put Andrew on the spot um, because he has been also working with a lot of, of uh, micro transit services in his work. Right. Yeah. And I think the vehicles are relatively small in comparison to. So I think, you know, Gordon said three passengers per hour in Sacramento. And and, and that's, you know, to put that in context, you know, a fixed route would have a lot more than that. A good fixed route would have 10, 12 or more. Um, so but micro transit. You know, sometimes they're using minivans or small vans, and, and it's it's geared towards low density areas that maybe fixed routes can't serve. So three or four is probably not a bad passengers 
passengers per hour for, for some kind of service like that, like transit. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Sarah, I know you answered this question in the chat box, but uh, for those who aren't monitoring the chat box, I'm just going to repeat the question. Maybe you could share the answer verbally. So um, the question was was in relation to your uh, comment about the passenger rail study and the timing of that versus the B line to Sacramento. And the question was, is if there is time, can you elaborate on why the bus study implementation would need to happen after completion of the rail study when it's a much shorter term project? So Sarah, do you want to maybe um, to sort of repeat your answer? Sure. And just in the chat box, I had written that the bus service that would provide access from Chico to Sacramento is being considered um, in the ongoing North Valley passenger rail study. And the bus service would be supplemental to the rail service. And so it's going to be considered as part of the study. That study should be complete by sometime next year. It's not to say that the bus service wouldn't begin until the rail service begins, but we do need to complete that study first because it is in partnership with the San Joaquins. I also did add that there are some delays on the San Joaquin side, and there are a lot of different variations in ridership from COVID and remote work that we saw kind of taking place as part of the study that we're going to continue looking at as part of the North Valley Rail study. Thank you, Sarah. And then we did receive one comment that Butte, Co <clears throat> excuse me, Butte College is interested in possible options for bus stops to be added at our main campus location. Uh, uh, onto the Chico to Oroville routes um, and Paradise to Oroville routes. Also additional service coverage for the South County areas, Biggs, Gr Gridley and Palermo, as well as Paradise. So um, just wanted to make sure we shared that as well, Gordon. Thank you, okay. love to look at that. All right, so now we'll go on. If, if we don't have any more clarifying questions or comments, we'll go on to our live polling. Again, uh, for those of you maybe who joined a little bit later, you have not had a chance to try this uh, live polling. If you want, you can just use your computer and go to www.menti, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com. And then you would add the code in, which is 97865963. Is that correct? I thought I saw a different number. Okay, no, it is correct. Okay. Uh, Okay, or you can use, if you have your uh, smartphone, you can uh, use the QR code to go directly to uh, the questionnaire. And so with that, the next question, do we wanna to move to the next question? Great. So now that you've heard a little bit about the micro transit, we are interested to find out if you are inclined, more inclined to use it. Uh, and <laughs> yes or no, and then if you uh, if you would like to share why or why not uh, in the chat box, that would be uh, extremely helpful as well. So we'll just give it a minute or two. Let folks answer. Okay, so we did get a comment from one of the participants that uh, the, the, the answer to the question might be a little bit more complicated than just yes or no, which is why we highly recommend it. You can add further comments or clarification um, if you'd like uh, in the chat box, but uh, the participant said they are way more likely to use BCAG microtransit than Uber or Lyft though. So. Um, Good to know. Uh, another participant said, I am disabled and would be more interested if improvements made. Um, okay. I as I understand it, microtransit could be great for door to door for short trips that are within the same zone. So Gordon, is that, would that be an accurate assessment? Yes. Um, it's zones that are maybe a few square miles so um, that's, that's a typical size for a, a microtransit zone. 
and and they also include a good connection to a transit hub if you want to go farther. But yeah, they're they're largely used for shopping trips or to get to um, a school in the neighborhood or to to get to the other the fixed routes are. Uh, they're interested in finding out also what are the anticipated fare structures for microtransit. Um, that I'll say is to be determined, but um, it's tip, it's often that it is the same fare as the fixed route, um, or it may be a little bit higher, like another fifteen or twenty-five cents, um, and. Uh, uh, to encourage people who can use the fixed route to use the fixed route, but it's in the same ballpark as the fixed route fares. So, Gordon, could you maybe do a little clarification on the zones? Because one of the comments we received was that if the zones are that small, um, as you had mentioned, uh, they would never use it, they would just use their bicycle. So, can you maybe explain the zone concept a little bit? Um, yeah, there, there are people who, you know, you're right that on a bicycle, but that's only. That can be a 10 minute bike ride. Um, and maybe three square miles is a little small. They can get larger than that. Um, but if you can imagine that two, two mile by two mile area, those are the sort of distances, two miles by three miles. Um, uh, those, that's kind of the size of zone that you're looking for. The, the, the danger with really large zones is that you can have one ride request that takes you halfway across town and you're spending a lot of time on that one trip. And you also have, because you're spreading the, the vans out so much, you're, you have less opportunity to have group trips, to pick up one person and another person and take them all into to a, a common destination. So there is, a, there is a kind of a sweet spot in the middle there where you're trying to serve those, those uh, relatively short trips. Um, so. Okay. Um, we have another comment. I support the concept of microtransit in areas that are all, that already exist and weren't built in a way that supports fixed routes. I would love to see it used in a way that nicely feeds into fixed routes, kind of like an alternative to biking for the first and last mile uh, for people who don't or can't bike. Something to consider. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, and I, I will just put in that, you know, the way we've built our cities you know, before World War II, we built cities with a nice grid street system, and it's it's easy for people like Andrew and Selena and I to to design bus routes that go past a lot of houses. And then you look at the, the what we did in the 70s and the 80s, and all those curvilinear streets that go up, um, and they're they're cul-de-sacs, and there are neighborhoods that you know fixed route can't get into. You can go buy it, but um, you really can't get to a lot of houses. And so that, that is one of the factors that when people look at this microtransit service, it can start to make some sense. And, and I'll add something to what you were saying, Gordon. It really is the balance of microtransit is the size of the zone and the, the length of time you wait for the, the vehicle. So, and, you know, it's, it's really about how many vehicles are you going to put in that zone? How big is the zone? But then you're also trying to keep it down to where you know, riders don't have to wait more than 15 or 20 minutes for a ride. And so the zones get too big and, and there's not a lot of vehicles in there and the wait time is long and it's not as useful. And I, I did see another question about door to door. Oftentimes these are sort of hybrid, the micro transits. Why don't we, uh, Andrew, if you don't mind, why don't we go ahead and uh, repeat the question so that people can understand the, what you're answering. So is it door, is it door to final destination or door to, to transit stop? Yeah, I, Gordon, you want me to take a first stab? Yeah, yeah it, you can go ahead. I'm sure you should. Okay. Um, I, I think it just varies, and and you know, oftentimes what I was going to say is that they're they're hybrid. You know, you you can register ahead of time if someone needs door to door service or needs an ADA vehicle, and that would be in the system and the vehicle every time that rider, um, you know, hailed a, a vehicle would always be curb to curb for them. Um, others who are um, you know, ambulatory, they could oftentimes just use virtual stops and, and you'd be assigned a virtual stop on the app or when you call in and you may have to walk a block or two. I um, mean, that makes it uh, a little bit more efficient and oftentimes can increase the number of times they're shared rides to make the service faster as well. 
but um, with regards to door, whether it's door to door or curb to curb, uh, if you're in, if you're want to go to the supermarket and it's in your zone, you get picked up close to your house and you get taken to the supermarket in your zone. Um, if you want to go across town to get get to Butte College, then we'll take you to the transit stop and you'll get on the fixed truck. Will transit uh, will micro transits have availability to be accessed by population call uh, to make appointments for pickup and drop off? So I think you were talking about you know the sort of online that we're wondering about the calling as well. There there is the opportunity in the software to do that. Um, to, to make a reservation or to what do what's called a standing order. Every, every Tuesday at eight o'clock, you need to get to the dialysis um, or something like that, um, that you will have a standing order and, and um, we'll come pick you up without a call. Okay. Uh, some comments. Uh, uh, I believe you college students would be interested in this type of uh, service or talking about micro transit, depending on location. If the micro transit zones are crafted carefully around social service hubs or low income housing areas, it could be very useful for low income residents. Um, let's see. I'm also curious about the above question on phone call requests. Uh, also curious how we may support riders who don't have smartphones or even cell phones. Do we have a lot of passengers who don't have phones or smartphones? Um. Andrew, I don't know if, what kind of numbers you see, but what I have seen is even in areas where there's lots of seniors and you wouldn't think that there would be a lot of smartphone use, people are largely getting their ride requests um, through a computer or a smartphone. Um, of course, we need to ensure that we're, you know, we do have access for people who have trouble with technology and we all have trouble with technology sometimes, don't we? Um, and uh, so there's always a phone call, a phone number to a dispatcher to be able to basically make your, your request for you. And, and exactly, and these are really designed to be accessible. So yeah, there's always a call center available, you know, in micro transit services. Um, and again, you could call ahead and, and, or, you know, when you schedule say that, you know, you're gonna need um, an accessible vehicle and, and all of that can be, um, is, you know, it's designed to provide that act. Great, thank you for that, for those clarifying questions or for answering those clarifying questions. Uh, and thank you for the questions. Um, okay, so we'll go to the next question in the polling if we don't have any more comments regarding microtransit. So um, Gordon had also mentioned a number of other potential improvement options and we would love to hear uh, your thoughts in regards to order of preference, what you think is, um, uh, what, what you find uh, to be a uh, higher level than, than, the, than the other improvements. So the first one is uh, <laughs> uh, expand hours of service, expand weekend service, and, and then provide buses with priority at key tra traffic signals. And so looks like everybody's putting their thoughts in, which is great. We'll just let it go a little longer. And again, if anybody has any clarifying questions that you might have regarding these uh, potential improvements, feel free to share them in the uh, chat box. Or if you want to uh, verbally ask your question, just, just raise your virtual hand. We can, we can uh, answer your questions. Also, if you have any follow-up comments that you'd like to make about why you uh, ranked them the way you did, uh, we'd love to hear that as well. So it's nice to sort of just get a little bit more background information. Yes, yes. and for example, for expanding weekend service, if there's a specific route or corridor that you'd like to see that, um, if it's Saturday, if it's Sunday, I'd love to see comments on that. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah, please. Uh, oh, we got Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. I think somebody would like Sunday service. Uh, we do have a question while while people are still filling out the uh, the online polling. Uh, how 
how do you plan to market and promote the new microtransit service? Um, is that that's going to be something that gets developed in the marketing plan a little bit later? Is that correct, Gordon? Yes, but, but let's decide whether we're going to do microtransit service before we, we develop the marketing plan for it. Um, but uh, that typically what is done is, is really try and reach beyond uh, the existing, you know, let's publish a schedule and or put posters up. Uh, they, you can imagine given it, that it's a technology that uses a smartphone, there's a lot of social um, marketing that's done um, for new services. Um, it's, there's marketing through schools, there's marketing through social service agencies and senior centers, um, really trying to hit them, the individual markets. Well, it looks like we've slowed down on the online polling. Does anybody have any further uh, comments they'd like to make about the expanded hours of service? Um, we, we did hear Sunday's, uh, Sunday service would be great. Uh, let's see, how, how might we do a bus priority? How might we do bus priority at signals? Would this involve bus only lanes? Um, I'm going to leap to a conclusion and say almost certainly not bus only lanes. Um, just they are difficult to implement in developed areas, um, particularly you know some of the corridors that we might be looking at, like on Park and so on or 20th. Um, and they're very expensive to build a bus only lane. Um, and to tell you the truth, we're you know, it's, it would make a lot more sense if we had 20 or 30 buses an hour going down a particular street. We're going to, we might end up with six or eight or maybe 10 buses an hour um, going down a particular street. So this is really more of focusing on taking those existing travel lanes. Um, and one strategy is just putting in the technology and that includes like a transmitter on the bus and a receiver on the signal so that the signal cabinet, those metal shiny things you see on the corner, it can say, ah, there's a bus coming. Let's give it another 10 seconds and we'll get that bus through and, and on its way, um, those sort of things. Um, the other strategy that can be looked at without moving curbs and, and drop inlets and all that civil engineering stuff that's so expensive is to take a right turn only lane and make it right turn with buses ex accepted so the bus can go through. And particularly if you've got like a bus stop on the far side of the signal. And so you know, you've got a right turn lane, the bus can stop there, it can go forward, it can pull into a bus stop, serve the stop, and then on its way. So those are the sort of things we'll be really focusing on. Thank you for that question. Could expanded hours of service utilize the smaller vehicles to make the service costs more economical for Beeline? Well, it could. Um, one of the kind of strange conundrums of public transit is that there's not a whole lot of cost savings of running a smaller bus. Um, maybe 10% less costly overall, uh, because we're paying the driver the same, whether they're driving a big bus or a little bus. Um, and that driver cost is most of the cost of actually moving the bus down the street. So. Yes, you do save a little bit on fuel. Um, you don't save a whole lot on maintenance. Um, the big buses actually last longer than the little buses. So you are replacing them more often. Um, but yes, there are, we can look at that idea of perhaps Sunday service. Hey, we had Sunday service up the ridge to paradise. Uh, maybe that could be a smaller uh, vehicle rather than a big bus. Well, there are no more uh, questions coming in the in the chat box. Uh, be, before we move on, um, I just wanted to check with both uh, Gordon, you, and and maybe uh, Sarah to see if you had any follow on questions that you know based upon what you what you got from the uh, online polling that you wanted to ask. No. No, I I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I. I always like the question, and it, maybe it's a little bit different question on, on microtransit, but what would, what factors do you think would convince your next door neighbor to use the service? So, <laughs> well, not you in particular, but 
the, the community in general, what, what do you think the community would like to see on microtransit? Well, we definitely heard from Butte, Butte College about the students being probably interested in, in it, but does anybody else have any uh, thoughts about your, your neighbors, your, your colleagues, um, what might get them interested? Somebody did mention, what, you know, ask the question about marketing and promotion of it. Were there any thoughts that you had in regards to uh, some, some good strategies around that? We would love to hear that too, I'm sure. Um, so we'll just give that a minute. And we have moved to the question and answer session, although we've been, we've been sort of doing that as we've, as we've gone along, but now's your opportunity also to ask any further questions of the team. And I always believe in giving it a nice pregnant pause. So we'll just, we'll just hang for a little bit while you're thinking. <laughs> Okay. All right. So I'm going to turn it over to, oh, we did get one comment. Um, one question, can we cancel the 40 and run more 41s? Um, we're going to be looking real closely at the overall ridership pattern up, up the ridge. Um, and I think one of the things that that Andrew and I have both looked at is, is or both started thinking about is making that more of a regular service all the way up the ridge. Um, so, and, um, so that may even be to the point where we've got hourly service that goes up there rather than kind of the, the hit or miss schedule that we have now. So yes, we can we'll look at that in lots of different ways. Okay, we did get a comment. I think it would be great for my low income elder clients to get to stores and appointments for microtransit. Uh, a, a suggestion for uh, promoting microtransit is uh, sponsored social media ads to promote, uh, information flyers to hand out on the bus uh, to share, uh, similar to a marketing brochure. Uh, we have a question, could there be reduced a reduced fare for uh, those who use the micro to microtransit to get to another major connection stop? Seeing Gordon nod his head. There, so. there, are, <laughs> there are examples of if you are, you know, you you essentially have a transfer. You board the the fixed route bus and say, I'm going to take microtransit to get home. And perhaps that is a 50 cents additional fee or something. Um, so there's there's lots because this is all kind of app-based technology, it's easy to to do a lot of different options like that. Great. Thank you. Uh, another comment, I had proposed hourly paradise uh, Mag Maglia uh, loop. Thank you. Uh, before the fire, before the fire, plus hourly Chico paradise loop. Demand is very different now. Um, 211 would definitely promote the microtransit option for our clients who need to get to stores, appointments, and social services. That's great. Uh, we have a comment, bigger cities use a transfer, yes. Okay. All right. Well, I, thank I, will, you. I, will, I will also add that we've been looking at the proposal for development up in Paradise and Megalia. Um, and it's, as you know, the developers that are coming in and they're like renovating a, a mobile home park or they're proposing new higher density areas, and the challenge up there is it, it really is all over. Um, so it is, it's kind of arguing for something like a micro transit service up there just because it's so spread out. Great. All right. Um, well, we'll move on. Uh, Sarah, do you want to uh, share the next steps? Sure. Thanks, Gladys. So we want to thank you all um, for joining us this evening. I feel like this was a really good conversation and we are happy to hear your thoughts. So thank you for your time. Um, we're definitely committed to providing ongoing public outreach throughout this project. So if you want to stay involved by visiting our website, we've included the link here. It's also in the chat box. And if you have any other questions or if you're thinking about this, you know, while you're going to bed tonight or later tomorrow, um, feel free to contact us. My email, I'll put it in the chat as well. And um, I'll hand it back over to you, Gladys. 
Great. Well, with that, um, if there aren't any more questions or comments, again, as Sarah mentioned, if you have an aha moment <laughs> later on, Sarah's definitely interested in it. And we did put her email address in the uh, in the chat box. So uh, feel free to share, share additional thoughts or ask questions there. Um, and again, we will be posting an abbreviated version of this presentation on the uh, on the on BCAG's website. Um, please share it with your friends, colleagues, uh, neighbors. And um, again, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us this evening. And thank you for all of the really wonderful questions and comments. It was uh, a very, very productive meeting for us. So thank you again and have a good evening. Um, may I just quickly say, okay. um, Gladys, do you wanna talk just for a second about the workshops and pop-up events that are coming in the fall that will be um, part of the next step of the project for the outreach? Sure, do we wanna bring that uh, slide back up? So yeah, when Gordon was going through the, um, through the uh, schedule, there were a couple of things that uh, are also identified, the pop-up workshops we will be hosting a pop-up workshop is just what it sounds like. It's we're going to go out to the community um, and we're going to uh, be asking sort of similar questions that we're asking here. Um, we know, you know, we always appreciate folks who are able to take the time to, to come to us, even if it's virtually, but we also know it's really important to, to go out into the public. So we will be doing a series of public, or excuse me, pop-up workshops where we'll be uh, exploring and trying to get more information. And I apologize, I, I, I've forgotten what the timing of that is. Selena, you, you put me on the spot. So Katie, Sorry about that. Well, no, that's okay, Katie. It, 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 it will basically come with our next step when we, um, when we come up with some alternatives that we have evaluated and we kind of have some performance of those and see which ones are, are shaking out to be the best. Then we'll bring that to the public and ask that for their feedback on, on our options. And that's, that's how we'll have the pop-up workshops and another um, public meeting at that time. So it'll probably be um, September, October. So Perfect. it's, it's a, little, <laughs> a little way, but it's, it's kind of the next big outreach part of this. All right. Thanks, Selena. Thanks for backing me up on that. <laughs> okay. Um, did I forget anything, Selena? Or? No, that was okay. that's good. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, if there aren't any more questions, again, I just want to thank everybody for your time and your input and wish you a good evening.